record to the computer. Okay. Hello, everyone. You are being recorded, just so you know. All right. So my name is Kevin, and we're going to have a walkabout tonight. Are you all able to hear me? Yes. Okay. We can if you need to share your screen, though. So. Oh, I haven't started yet. But right. yeah, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and ask. If you come after the fact and have some questions, you may always email me or call. That's a okay. Um, so yeah, let's get going. And we're gonna do Castles of Colorado here. Let me start the show. All right, I hope you're all able to see that. Should just say Castles of Colorado at the moment. Okay, so we're gonna start with the Richthofen Castle and just a little bit of history. Back in the day, the thing you started with when building out here in the West would have been wood. That's what we had plenty of around, at least to start. There were trees along the creeks and rivers, and so folks would have used that in order to build their little crude log huts and such. The earliest buildings in Denver would have been in that, and they would have denuded all of the trees by the creeks and rivers very quickly. So it wasn't too long before they had to find something else to build with. And we had a lot of rock and stone. So they decided that that would make a lot of sense to use. Also, it, rock and stone tends to burn less. So we had a devastating fire in Denver in 1863, followed by a flood in 1864. The flood was not such a problem necessarily, wood versus stone. But the fire had certainly uh, made people think that we needed to do something else. After that, a little while after that, they passed a law saying all buildings in Denver had to be made of brick or stone. And that law remained in effect until the mid-1900s, which is great for the longevity of a building. It does tend to stick around longer made of brick or stone. Brick is the cheaper of the two. And many of the cities around the metropolitan area produced a lot of brick because they had a lot of clay. So stone came largely from Colorado and Arizona. If you were going for your sandstone, the building that you see here in this picture, that is rhyolite, which is a volcanic stone. The quarries in Castle Rock, I believe one is still open but the quarries in Castle Rock produced a lot of this very durable, beautiful, hard, expensive stone. So even among the stone and brick buildings, there is a hierarchy. Brick is the cheapest. From then you move up to sandstone, which is the cheapest of the stones, and up through the granite. If you wanted to get really fancy, you put on terracotta. That was pretty nice and expensive long ago all the way up to the super expensive ones like rhyolite, as you would have had here. In Denver, the law said you had to made a brick, be made of brick or stone, but places outside of the city also took on this way of building uh, because it was sensible in an era when you had lots of fires. Also, it's a way to show off your money. So some of the buildings that we're going to see tonight are examples of the latter. And in fact, we're going to start with one of those right here, the Richthofen Castle. So we had lots of immig immigrants from around the world. And I find it very fascinating that no one goes to a new city with lots of money and says, I'm going to open up a neighborhood for the poor. When you have people with money, they always say, I'm going to open up a neighborhood for the rich and the famous which is exactly what a Prussian immigrant. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting feedback from someone. Uh, Kevin, you can hit the mute all button and mute everybody as well. Okay. It's one, it's one, it's one. 
know someone's audio is on and is creating feedback. Okay. I don't actually know where the mute all button is. Well, I don't hear it right now, so I guess we're going to go on. Yeah. If you click on participants, it's at the very bottom of the participants list. OK. Mute all. OK. Thank you. OK, so the Richthofen Castle was built by a Prussian immigrant, the Baron von Richthofen, Walter von Richthofen. He would be famous later on because he was the uncle of the Red Baron who made a lot of kills in World War I or the Great War. However, before the Red Baron was doing his thing in the 1900s, the Baron von Richthofen came to Denver in the 1800s, the late 1800s, and he decided he was going to settle east of downtown Denver and make a new city. And that new city was going to be a place for the well-to-do. It was going to be everything that was the finest. He came to Colorado in 1877, very enthusiastic. He built the castle that you see right here. And he named it Louisburg after his wife, Louise. And then he started to promote his city. It was a city with quotes like this. Montclair, homes for invalids, for asthmatics, and others requiring a home near Denver beyond the smoke of the city. Montclair offers a delightful and suitable locality, being 330 feet higher than Denver with the finest views attainable. Pure air, artesian water, the best public schools, it is the handsomest of the suburbs of Denver. So in the late 1880s, when uh, Montclair got its start, it seemed to be a place of promise. It had this beautiful castle right at the center of it. Colfax, which comes out, uh, east out of Denver, uh, would have been the main road. And there were some problems that he thought he could conquer. It was very dry. So he worked with folks to bring ditches out to the area. And he also worked with the city to try to bring the streetcar out. Neither of these would save the city, however. The streetcar took too long to get there. The water was there, but no one wanted to move out because it was insufficient water, insufficient connection. Even his own wife didn't really want to live there. She said it was too barren. Uh, the baron built a moat around this castle almost entirely. It wasn't actually a moat where it entirely encircles the castle. Really, it was a uh, canal. So if you had the castle here, the moat came in, went around like this, came to the other side, and then continued on its way. So it almost completely surrounded the castle. The city had financial ruin cast upon it with the crash of 1893. And then it just became a neighborhood in Denver, which it is today. The uh, neighborhood of Montclair is very popular. So when I am giving my tours along Colfax, I talk about what I call failed real estate developments. They are ones that did not succeed at the time, but today are quite prosperous. So here's another picture of the castle. And we are going to go inside a little bit. Just some general pictures showing you that rhyolite stone. I actually have way more pictures than I could possibly have shared with you. This is one of those great moments when I actually had my camera. So I was, I was pleased. So if you look at the rhyolite, you can see that it has multiple colors within it. None of them are particularly bright. But according to the accolades poured upon this back in the 1800s, it was filled with pinks and blues and greens and blacks and silvers. They said that there were lots of colors in it if you got up really, really close. Inside, the Baron, for his wife, Louise, spared uh, nothing. Everything was going to be the best and the brightest. So over time, the castle would go through multiple owners. As the Baron lost control of it with the crash of 1893, it did pass into other hands. 
the economy saw this building suffer just as well. For our modern telling of the story, maybe 50, 60 years ago, right in that area, it was a home with a carriage house and the grounds, but the owners ended up selling off the carriage house. The owners of the carriage house built a large wall between the castle and the carriage house, transforming the castle house into a house. And for decades, they were completely separate. The current owners, in the process of fixing up every last detail, they went ahead and they bought the carriage house and that other property. They removed the wall. So for the first time in my lifetime, a couple of years ago, the two pieces were put back together. So it's, it's very nice. So most of the details that you're seeing in here are uh, accurate. Some of the fixtures have had to be replaced over time because as new families came in, they had modern tastes and things were removed. The current family has some money, so they're restoring what's there and they are doing research to find out what was there before modern things were put in and they're putting them back. Really, none of the furniture to speak of is uh, original to the Richthofen family. All those pieces would have been sold off. The furniture, however, is by and large uh, of the period. The chandeliers, some of the chandeliers throughout the castle are original and others are replacements for ones that they had shown in pictures. So they've actually had chandeliers made for the place. As you can see from the interior of the castle, lots of wonderful wood paneling. Unlike some buildings in Denver, the Richthofen Castle tended to stick with uh, the same wood throughout. They did put in embellishments within the wood, but didn't necessarily have lots of different types of wood. So, as I said, uh, I have lots of pictures. So, I took for this, uh, presentation, I took the ones that I thought were the most interesting. So here's the same room, just two different views of it. Oh, sorry. There's the front hallway leading out to the front door. Now, you may take tours of this building rarely. The family has declared that they will offer tours of the castle. Uh, it's not on a predictable basis, so you just have to watch. The upstairs, as I understood it from my tour back in 2015, the upstairs as the family area was really not going to be included in tours. They were just going to have the downstairs. You see in the picture here some of what they were fixing beyond the chandelier there. You see some damage, water damage in the roof, lots of water damage in the building. And we have some little pieces outside. Um, according to the, the writings from the contemporaries from the Baron, the face that you see there on the left is the famous red beard Barbosa. So uh, a, a figure that the Baron von Richthofen would have known well and so sort of put up there to scare away anyone who might come to do ill to his castle or his city. Now there were, believe it or not, uh, some other castles built in Montclair, one very large. Unfortunately, the Richthofen Castle is the only one that survived. The other ones were gone, are gone. So it's a sad loss. You would think they would keep a castle, but castles are very expensive. So here's an exterior shot from the rear. So you are looking where, uh, as you can see from the car, where they bring uh, themselves in and get out to go in. So this is not as beautiful a picture, but you can see even from this side, they have some pretty pieces. This is the carriage house. The carriage house, uh, it is the same building in both pictures. I just have different angles, different parts of the building. If you look at the picture in the upper left, we are inside the grounds of the Richthofen Castle. If you look through that gate there, you can actually see a house that's across the street. That's Pontiac Street in Denver. So you're looking across the street. That opening there is where 
the Richtofens would have ridden their horse and carriage into the interior courtyard and then come into the castle. So the later owner made it into what you see today, put the ivy and such up on it, and again, transformed it from a carriage house, which was never meant to be lived in, into a full house with a dishwasher and toilets and everything that you might need for modern comforts. So when I was there in 2015, the family was not 100% certain what they were going to do with the carriage house. Uh, if you put it back to its original look, then you have to remove a lot of things out of it, but we don't necessarily need carriage houses anymore because we're not keeping horses and carriages. So that was a debate. And as you see, I haven't been back since 2015, so I actually need to go back and take another tour. Fortunately, I have an inn at the house, so maybe I'll be able to set one up for myself. We shall see. Okay, now just a couple blocks down from the castle, there are uh, a few things to see. There are some monuments honoring uh, that family, and there's this building right here. This is the Molkery. The I don't speak German, but Molkery, as I understand it, is Milk House in German, built in 1888. It served as a uh, dairy. So, as a student of weird things from the past, I love this story. If you look at the building, the lower right-hand side, the ground floor is where they had the cows. The tuberculosis patients were on the main floor. Between the ground, the lowest floor and the middle floor, instead of having solid floor, you had grating so that all of the health-giving fumes from the cows could waft up into the eager lungs of the patients suffering from tuberculosis on the middle floor. So I spent part of my youth on a farm, so I don't necessarily mind the smell of cows, but I think a lot of people would have found that a bit intense. Uh, it has today the sort of civic center for the neighborhood, and it's really amazing that we still have it. A lot of buildings from this area would not be with us. So it's not a castle. It, it's just a building uh, that was built by the same fellow. So I thought I'd point it out to you. All right, let's see if I have any other good quotes on the Richtofen Castle. Oh, this one, uh, this one newspaper was lamenting, where but a few months ago, the bounding antelope and restive jackrabbit were seen, and now a suburban town is springing up from the dust. So I think they were a little sad. But in the end, we're glad for it today. Okay, so we're actually going to come now closer to your part of the world, with the uh, Cherokee Castle. I have been to the Cherokee Castle for tours and teas. And it's been a few years since I went. As you can see from the picture of a bit of a rainy day the last time I was there. Um, here's the problem. I did not take my camera since I didn't know at the time that I would need it for a presentation. So I just had a few external shots. And one of your colleagues actually sent me the interior I don't know pictures. What okay, so this is the view from the rear of the building toward Devil's Head. And in the foreground, you Devil's can see, Head. That's Devil's Head, yes. So someone is talking. If you would please mute your, uh, please mute, mute your microphone. I can come in and do that too if necessary. All right, there. I have muted. Okay, I was actually there in 2010, good gracious, a long time ago for a tea. So now we come to some of the interior pictures for the Cherokee. So the Cherokee Castle, the Cherokee Castle actually started out as some homesteads by folks back in the 1800s, and they went into ranching and growing various uh, agricultural products and such. The castle was built in 1924, I believe it was, yes, uh, as a 1450s Scottish style castle. So this is meant to look like something from the 1400s. So 1924, good gracious, they're gonna be 100 years old here in just a couple of years. 
the person that most people associate with the castle is this lady here, Tweet Kimball. She came out and bought the place in 1954, and she wanted to work with cattle. So as I understand it from my tour there, Tweet did not necessarily know a lot about cattle raising, but she was going to give it a go. And some laughed at her for trying to bring certain breeds into the area, but she was very diligent in her work and in the end was able to succeed, uh, turning the place into a very prosperous ranch. In 1995 or six, let's see, 1996, Ms. Kimball worked with the Douglas County uh, citizens and government to try to set aside the land and the castle in some sort of conservation easement. Since you're in Douglas County, I'm assuming most of you are in Douglas County. Douglas County has this general plan. It's going to develop the northern end of the county and keep rural and beautiful and empty, except of grass and such, the southern end of the county. But that's not to say there aren't some things at the northern end which they wish to maintain. And so they ended up working on this and getting it set aside. It is managed by the Cherokee Ranch and Castle Foundation. And Ms. Kimball died in 1999. Uh, since that time, I have been, as I said many times, for teas and tours. And I think that's what most folks think of it as. But you can also go for weddings and the like there. I haven't been to a wedding there yet. I bet it would be beautiful. So these are some of the pictures sent by one of your colleagues there. So there's Miss Kimball. So the Great Hall. So for those of you who've read Beowulf, back in the day, the hall was really the only room. Most of the long houses of the time would simply have been one interior space. And they talk about this in some books of the time like Beowulf. And it's sort of funny uh, I was reading in a book by Bill Bryson how the hall, which used to be the entire house, is now just a tiny, generally only used for walking through part of the house. But here in the Cherokee, they restore the meaning of hall back to what it once was. It's the meeting place. It's where you dine or chat or whatever it might be within it. So this is uh, where they show off that fancy woodwork as they would have had in Scotland back in the day. This is where the teas take place. Now the dining room, you can see that they have, or the, uh, the family has invested in some of this fine decorations, the terracotta and ceramic decorations over there. Once upon a time, uh, very expensive. Today, I think it's much more commonplace and much more affordable to have such things. I did mention earlier terracotta. If you put that on the outside of your building back in the early 1900s, that showed you had a lot of money. The turret room, pretty self-explanatory. If you do end up taking a guided tour of the castle, they're going to walk you through and give you the history of many of these places. They also have uh, illustrations, signs, as you can see in here, it's talking about the cattle, talking about the history of some of the rooms. Now, if I recall correctly, you may not sleep at the Cherokee Castle. It is not an overnight bed and breakfast type of thing, but they do have weddings. And when the bride needs to get ready, the bride is going to need a place to get away. So they have rooms like this one. Uh, they have several of them, in fact, where the bride and her party may get away so that no one sees. So it is a bedroom because it was a bedroom. But again, I don't think anyone sleeps in them anymore. And just because no castle is complete without the upstairs being mirrored by the downstairs, we have the butler's pantry shown in there. And this is where the rest of the folks would have worked once upon a time. And I apologize for the stark light. Um, I'm the only place I have internet where I may plug in here. There, there are no actual lights in here. So I know I look like a cadaver. 
And here's a picture of a presentation within the Great Hall, just to show you uh, sort of what it looks like when bustling with activity. Okay, but not every castle is a home. Some castles uh, serve other purposes. And it just dawned on me, oh, there, good. Okay, I couldn't remember if I put in a picture of the exterior of the building. Okay, so this is South Broadway Christian Church. And this is a picture of the exterior. Now, in the world of architecture, there are lots of names for architectural styles. So Art Deco, Art Modern, etc. The style name for this is Chateauesque, which is French. It means like a castle. Maybe not super creative, but there you go. So the South Broadway Christian Church is not actually located on Broadway. This is a church in Denver. It's located on Lincoln. The original church, however, was on Broadway, and that's where it got its name, South Broadway Christian Church. And the reason it has a new look and a new location is because of an act of love after a tragedy. Two of the parishioners within the castle, or excuse me, within the church, were John and Henrietta Sutton, and they lived nearby. They went to the original church and had a great life. But one day, when Henrietta was working in the garden, she tripped, fell, hit her head, and died. John was so bereft at the death of his wife that he decided he was going to have a monument built in her honor. He sold his house sold his land and took all of his money, gave it to the church and said, I want you to build a church. With this money, I have two stipulations. Number one, it has to be in honor of my wife. And number two, I have to be able to live in it until I die. And both were honored. So this church is in honor of Henrietta Sutton, here are some uh, interior views of the church. From the interior, maybe you don't see that it's a castle on the outside, but I didn't feel I could show you the exterior without showing you some of the interior. Oh, the lady who runs the tours here at this place, she's super nice, and I've taken many tour groups there, so if you ever get a chance, you should give uh, yourself that benefit and go for a tour. So the picture in the lower right-hand corner is also mirrored in the upper left-hand corner, just a different angle. I don't know if any of you know what those balconies are. During services, they would open those balcony windows. That was where mothers could take fractious children. The idea being that the loud kids would be out of the main worship space and would not be as much of a detraction from the service. Uh, I don't know if that worked or not. What I do find amusing is you can't really tell in the lower right-hand side the scale, but that banister, which is designed to keep the children from falling over the edge down to the floor below, is maybe, maybe up to your knee. It's not even that. So any child of any size practically could get up on that and fall over to his or her detriment but apparently it was enough back in the day. I did like to, or I do like to point out that the baptismal font there is as big as a hot tub. And when the, the preacher is going to be baptizing people in there and they fill it with water, it's so gigantic that all the cold water sinks and the hot water rises, which means when you get in there, he said, you're knees down are freezing, your knees up are boiling. He said, so before we do baptisms, we take a canoe paddle and mix up the water so that we don't have freezing and boiling during baptisms. Now, there are some stairs. The picture on the left-hand side, that is a doorway which is normally closed. It leads to the stairs, which lead, uh, lead the stairs lead up to his apartment in the tower. The tower that you saw earlier is made up of his apartments. This was his little waiting room. I guess I did not include a picture of the living room, 
But you can see it's not a lot of space, but he at this point was a widower. He didn't need a lot of space. So today these are kept as a memorial to what they were. They aren't used for anything else. So that's South Broadway Christian Church, which I'll go back again. I don't know, what do you think? Kind of looks like a castle there. And you can see that turret on the lower, uh, excuse me, on the right-hand side, that is the residence of Mr. Sutton for the many years of the remainder of his life. Okay, so now we're going to get out of the Denver metro area and we're going to head south to Colorado Springs, the new port of the Rockies, as it was once known. Also had the nickname Little London. The picture on the right hand side, that is Cheyenne Mountain. NORAD is in there. I missed my chance to go in and take a tour, and now I don't, uh, I think they don't give tours at all. On the left-hand side, you see one of the things that drew a lot of people to Colorado Springs. Tuberculosis was a big killer in the day, and a lot of folks came out for their health. This is a tubercular hut, or tent, as they call it, even though it's not a tent. This one is on the grounds of a hospital in Colorado Springs, and if you know where to look, there are actually several throughout the city, but uh, very few left compared with the hundreds that once were. Also, uh, the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs, the main original hall on the site is a former uh, sanitarium. So a lot of history there. But the reason that we're going south is not to talk about tuberculosis, it's to talk about this beautiful castle right here. So William Jackson Palmer, as the tour guide at this castle said, had a lot of money, so he wanted to go west and play with trains. So he comes out west, and instead of playing with model trains, he builds train companies. So he had a lot of money. He didn't have to worry about it. He comes to Colorado Springs, and he decides he's going to make a – excuse me. He comes to the area that is today Colorado Springs, and decides he's going to make a city for the well-to-do. There is already a city nearby. Manitou Springs and Colorado City are both nearby, but he is going to make a prim and proper city. It will be a dry city, and it will be everything great. He takes land at the northern end of Garden of the Gods. So if you see in this picture to the left-hand side of the castle, you see some of those red sandstone features. In the foreground, the castle itself, they, they used stone for the construction. Again, we have lots of it locally, so that's what they used. Here is from a tour that we took. You see more of those wonderful red sandstone structures. Those red, stone, those red sandstone features are the same red sandstone features that you will find at Garden of the Gods, or excuse me, Red Rocks Amphitheater, Roxboro State Park, all those places. And it's the same formation, the Morrison Formation. Now, Palmer built this place so that his wife and daughter could come out and have a good time living with him and enjoying the beautiful scenery and the great air and sunshine. His wife, however, a Queen was her nickname. She did not like it. It was too far away. And Colorado Springs may one day become a civilized place, but nope. Not at the time, too far away, not civilized at all. So even though Palmer spent uh, the rest of his life there, most of the rest of his life was without his wife. She would come for visits. His three daughters would come for visits, but in the end, they didn't spend a lot of time there. So during their travels, they did gather lots of memorabilia, as you see here on the right-hand side. And they had marvelous uh, decorations put in because they had lots of money. This was the place where they were going to show off. I got something blinking at me here. Hold on. Okay. So the lower right-hand corner, they have teas and tours. The one thing I don't have a picture of is the, in my opinion, best thing about Glen Airy, and that is the madrigal. So 
every December in normal years, I have, I don't have high expectations that they're going to do it this year, but in normal years, what they do is in the grand dining room, they have a medieval feast with music, uh, very light dancing. You, as a participant, you just sit and have your meal and enjoy the show, but you don't actually dance or anything. And it's great. The smart thing to do is stay overnight at the Glenary. That way, after your show, you don't have to drive home. You just stay there. You get to drive home the next morning in the sunshine. So Glenary is a bed and breakfast type thing where you, although I don't think you get breakfast, but you do get to stay overnight there. So after your madrigal, you can have the fun of it. Not far away is Miramont Castle. This is in Manitou Springs. So Miramont Castle, I like to call the Franken Castle because like Frankenstein's monster, it was put together with pieces of various corpses, or in this case, it was put together at different times. So there are actually four periods of construction in Miramont Castle. A Catholic priest born in France ended up moving out to our part of the world, Father Francolon. He came out and decided that what he wanted to build was a castle. So he started uh, back in the 1890s and built the original part of the castle, which is sort of that central section there. In the end, he left rather ex unexpectedly. There may have been financial uh, corruption going on. We're not 100% certain, but he did leave. And so then the Sisters of Mercy bought the place. It again was built onto uh, here and there over time and uh, expanded as you see. So we're going to go inside a little bit. The Sisters of Mercy for, were renowned for, quote, the excellence of their table, the cleanliness of their rooms, and their motherly care for health seekers. So within the building, you may take a self-guided tour. The piece of paper that you get will take you around and tell you what you're seeing. If you don't want to carry around the paper, they also have signs. I just chose some here. Father Francolone used this room to welcome guests and hold receptions. He was building over time and not even in the same styles. Within the building, he had Byzantine and Romanesque and other styles and evidence. And this room has two, both of those. The fireplace is hand cut stone. It goes seven feet back into the mountain. The fireplace weighs over 400,000 pounds. The pillar off to the left hand side to the left of those curtains was actually painted that color to match what's above the fireplace. Uh, gold leaf paint was put into the ceiling. It is not gold leaf anymore. All that was gone during the troubled times of the later 1900s, but it's painted gold to make it as it was once upon a time, or at least to look as it was once upon a time. As the building changed hands, as it went through different uses, as a flop house, as an apartment, uh, just things changing, they were constantly moving walls, moving staircases, and many of the staircases were removed. The building is now owned by the historical society there, and they have replaced all of those staircases, including this one. If you look to the left-hand side there, you'll see some pictures. And off to the right-hand side, you see some more. Throughout the building, there are lots of pictures of the building's history and to a lesser degree of the regional history, Manitou Springs, that sort of thing. So they had a conservatory. And this was also where the sisters would perform their operations. The sisters did minor things like setting bones and stitches, anything bigger than that, they would send the person off to a doctor. But the sisters were capable of those things and they actually turned this original conservatory into a medical ward. And you can probably guess why, you're gonna have great light through all those windows. And if you have to slice and dice someone or stitch them up, you might as well have a lot of light to do it. This, I think, uh, just surprised me. That actually is an anchor. 
So what you have, the anchor that you see here, in the middle there's a connection and it's attached to a rod that is driven into the mountainside because the mountain is like this and the castle sticks out of it like this. Well, it uh, is built up the mountainside and it could fall down or it could just slough off. So what they've done is they've put in the anchors. So there are eight anchors that secure the castle. Each one of them like this is driven 16 feet into the solid stone of the mountain. And all you see are these little anchors. So they wanna make sure that the castle does not fall off, which I think is a good idea. So Miramont Castle in Manitou Springs. Okay, sorry. I thought that was one of you contacting me. It is not one of you contacting me. Okay, Bishop Castle. Woohoo! We've gone even farther, farther south. So this one is west of Pueblo. If you come south out of Canyon City, instead of going over toward Pueblo, if you turn toward the west to go over toward Custer County and West Cliff, and then turn south, you will come to Bishop Castle. As you can see, I went with my friends back in, what was this, 2004, and took some pictures. Now again, at the time, I did not know I was going to be working in history, so I just took a couple pictures. So I had to go recently to take a few more pictures. Now, the females here, they are very happy and brave, but my friend here on the lower left-hand side, you can see he's afraid because we have climbed up into the stratosphere. And let me tell you, the Eiffel Tower in Paris, you can feel it moving a little. This, you can feel it moving a lot. And that can be a bit disconcerting when you get up there. To illustrate this, I went back in July and took a few more pictures. So let's talk a little bit about Bishop Castle. It is a super long story. The manifesto that Mr. Bishop wrote is many pages, and I read it, and then I just, just tried to synthesize down a few salient points because otherwise reading the entire manifesto to you would be a lot. So this is six pages taken down to a paragraph. Young Jim Bishop in 1959, at the ripe old age of 15, paid $450 for a two and a half acre parcel of land enclosed on three sides by the majestic San Isabel National Forest in Southern Colorado. It was money saved from mowing lawns, throwing newspapers, and working with his father in the family ironworks. Jim had dropped out of high school that year over an argument from his English teacher who yelled at him and said, you will never amount to anything, Jim Bishop. In 1969, at the age of 25, Jim decided it was time to build a cabin in the mountains, and so he did. This was about 1969. So what he did is salvage pieces from junkyards or from friends, and at one point he got a water tank because he needed water, but he decided it was too ugly, so he put stones around it, and people driving by and his friends said, huh, that looks like a turret of a castle. Hey, Jim, you should build a castle. And he said, yeah, I should build a castle, which he started to do in the 1970s. Folks, he is still building the castle. The castle is a lot of salvage. He doesn't take money from anyone by way of the federal government or state government. He will take donations from just Mr. and Mrs. Tourist, but no government entities. And he, what he can't buy, he will scrounge and he puts things together. So on the left-hand side, I don't know if you can see all the stonework coming up to some of those wrought iron structures up above. You see a brave person walking across there, upper right. The upper left-hand picture, you can see the dragon. The dragon does spit flames. And the stained glass window room there, you can see they have a beautiful setting and they will have weddings. So that's Bishop Castle. If you haven't been, it's a, an experience. You should go. 
So the Highlands Ranch Castle is in Highlands Ranch. I love honesty in advertising. So this one I didn't even bother trying to, there are just too many names. Over the years, the castle has gone through many owners and many builders. So there are some names that are associated with it perhaps a little more, certainly Phipps. I always knew it when I first learned about it as the Springer Castle because I originally thought that was the owner. I since found out that there were many owners and the Springer Castle was just the name of one person. But perhaps the biggest name, as I said, would have been the Phipps name. In 1937, uh, he bought the property and turned it into a larger property by buying some neighboring pieces. And in the 1970s, it was sold and became part of the uh, Mission Viejo, I think it is, part of the, yeah, Mission Viejo Company, part of the redevelopment of the area, which would later lead to Highlands Ranch. And then the Shea Company came in and they've done some restoration to it, a lot of restoration to it. And it is today the Highlands Ranch Castle. I've taken many tour groups through there and quite lovely, as I'm sure you know. And I have never actually been to a tea there, but I'm sure that a tea there would be great. So I took a few pictures and was asked to put in some more from my last visit. This was, well, this is not actually my last visit, but it was the visit where I had a camera. So the building is meant to be used for events. So as you can see, they've got a lot of great spaces. They also have some wonderful authentic elements such as the bathroom here. My mother said I had no sense of what colors are called. I think she would say that's coral, maybe. I'd have to ask her if she were still here. So that's the Highlands Ranch Castle. I'm sorry, I actually have probably 100 pictures, but I only have so much time. And we are zooming toward our conclusion here. Zoom, zoom, zoom. So this one, I don't know if you're aware of it, is actually in the news right now uh, a little bit. It's for sale again. So two things. If any of you have $25 million lying around, this place could be yours. It's 100% worth it. Number two, I would like you to hire me to be the tour guide there because I would love to be the tour guide there. So it's for sale. It's looking for an owner, owner and I would like to be your property manager and tour guide. Alas, if you don't have $25 million lying around, well, what are you going to do? So this uh, building was built by a gentleman, Mr. John Osgood, 1902. At the time, Mr. Osgood was actually one of the richest men in the country. Let's see, I wrote it down. Uh, supposedly the sixth, sixth richest man in the country. He was hobnobbing with all of the big folks. He had made a lot of money working in oil and other industries back east, and he decided he was going to come west and make himself a home. So he built this beautiful castle that you see here. He called it Cleave Home, which means beside the river or alongside the river. Today it's called the Redstone Castle instead of the Osgood Castle or Cleave Home because the city of Redstone is spitting distance from this castle and so just over time, it has garnered the name of the nearest city, so the Redstone. A few years ago, I was invited into the castle as part of the tour development program. Unfortunately, that program didn't end up taking off. I did my part, but they didn't really do their part. So the program is a no. And I actually have a tour scheduled and an overnight, because this is a bed and breakfast for next May, but I just found out that it's gonna be sold and I wrote them and they said, well, yes, your tour may be canceled. So you, you may keep your reservation, but we don't actually know what will happen. So I'm hoping that I end up getting to take my group next year at the end of May. So they sent me some pictures. These are not my pictures. These are ones that they sent to me. So you see the upper left-hand corner this is the view from the breakfast areas just to the left. This is the view from that breakfast nook and patio down toward the Crystal River and the beautiful sunny south side of the castle. In the olden days, as it was, it looks much like that today. 
many bedrooms within the building and the hall, the lodge in the lower right-hand side there, that is where Mr. Osgood would have shown off the trophies of his many hunts. He loved to hunt and many folks spent time at the estate. If you know the history of hunting in Colorado, you know that Teddy Roosevelt loved to come out here and hunt in addition to Montana and other places. So he stayed here, the Rockefellers stayed here, uh, the Morgans stayed here. I mean, big names stayed in this place. So it was definitely a known quantity. quantity. So this is a tour group that I was on when I got to take my pictures. You can see the lady on the stair is in costume. She was our tour guide. Okay, so we are right on schedule. I like to leave time at the end for questions, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen here so that I may see the chat. Ooh, no lots one's of questions. actually had you any questions yet. So No one sent any questions yet. Okay. So, so at this point, I guess if they want to unmute and ask a question, they can ask a question and then mute themselves again. All right. Let's see here. Uh, yes. So ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions, just unmute and we will answer any questions. If you come up with questions after the fact, you may always email me or call me. They are in the chat at the beginning of the chat up there if you want to find those. Uh, and I didn't even touch on all the castles that I could have touched on. There are two in Denver, one on the way up to Conifer. So too many castles. Any questions? Hey, Kevin. Yes. Can I ask you what the name of the castle is on the way to Conover? Conover? Um, that is uh, the Dunifin Castle, something with a D. I think it's Dunifin. Uh, is that on like 285? Yeah. Uh, no, it is, it is the Lariat Loop. It's the one that goes from Morrison up. I don't remember the number, but if you come out of Morrison, so it's not 285. If you come out of Morrison up the hill, that will take you up the Lariat Loop to Conifer and not to Conifer, I'm sorry, Evergreen. Uh, okay. Evergreen, sorry, mixing up my castles. Okay. I have never actually been in that castle. There is a book, however, called The Castles of Colorado, and the author of that book did get to go inside and take pictures. Since I don't own any pictures from that, I don't show them here. I try not to steal. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I may have stunned you all into silence. Well, I guess it, mine doesn't go through. Okay. Uh, let's see. There's a question over here in the chat. How to set up a tour of the Redstone Castle? So I actually have the contact information. It would likely be easier for you to email me or call me. I don't have it in my head, but I could give you the information either via email or phone. So if you were to shoot me an email or call me tomorrow, I know the lady is named April, and I know that the own the owners or excuse me the company that owns the redstone is also where the hotel denver is in glenwood springs but yeah the actual email address and phone number i'd have to i'd have to give you after the fact however they do give tours just intermittently and now that it's for sale you might want to do it now while you know you can because the new owners might make it into a private residence again so what qualifies a building to be a castle it is a number of rooms and number uh, or square footage. Uh, according to one of the architectural digests that I read, one of the other architectural digests that I read, and I don't know if any of you are architects, I have noticed that architects are just like artists. They don't agree. And one will say something is this, it's Tudor, and the other one say, that's not Tudor, that's Gothic. So it's artistic. I had another architectural book say that what makes a castle is the appearance. It should look like a castle. It could be small and still be a castle because of the appearance. So it's a stylistic element. So you take your pick on which one you want. Where is Redstone Castle located? If you drive west on I-70, 
and then you go south from Gledwood Springs as if you were going to Aspen, there's a point where instead of turning off to go to Aspen, instead you go south to Marble and to Redstone. Redstone uh, castles, essentially part of the city of Redstone. And the Redstone Inn is in Redstone too. And I think that's the thing that mo more people are familiar with from Redstone because you may stay overnight there and have a great Thanksgiving dinner. Any final questions? Um, can you name some of the castles you didn't include in the presentation? Just off of the top of my head, uh, I didn't talk about the Castle Marne. I didn't talk about the Croke Patterson Campbell Mansion. I did not talk about uh, the Summer White House on the top of Mount Falcon. I didn't talk about the one on the way up to Evergreen. And there's one that I'm not thinking of. But there are there are others. There it is, Dunavon Castle. Woohoo! Someone has typed it in. How many of these are on the National Register? That actually I do not know. That book that I mentioned to you, Castles of Colorado, would completely answer that question. Otherwise, it would just be a search online or calling the places. That is not a detail that I noted, unfortunately. So is there a map available that shows the various castles in Colorado? There is not one consent or a concise listing except in that book, The Castles of Colorado. If you type any of these in online, you will find, find out where they are. So at this point, we are at 8.01. So I'm going to bid you good night. However, I'll type my contact information in here. Again, if you end up with any questions, I super don't mind. Castles of Colorado is out online. And here is my contact information. I won't be answering the phone tonight or answering emails, but I'd be happy to shoot something your way in the future. Uh, thanks for spending some time with me. I'm sorry if I didn't hit your favorite castle. And I don't know when we'll see you, but I hope it will be in person and very soon. Ladies Thank and gentlemen, you. stay safe, stay healthy, great healthy lungs, and I'll see you again at some point in the future. Thank right. you. Thank you and very much, night. Kevin. You're welcome. Okay. All right. Good night, everybody, and thank you all for joining today. We hit 100 participants at one point in time, so I think that was the max on this uh, particular call. We'll have to work on getting that max increased in the future. Nice. Good night. <laughs>